and I would like to welcome you all to this evening's 25th anniversary screening of Dead Poets Society, uh, a, a special tribute to the Robin Williams. This is the culmination of a whirlwind of four days. On uh, the opening of the festival, we saw four governors under one roof in the Paramount Theater, along with Ashley Judd, Patrick Wilson, Jenna uh, Elfman, Jasmine Guy. We've had Academy Award winning director Barry Levinson on hand, two Pulitzer Prize winners in Rita Dove and Doug Blackman, a civil rights legend in Julian Bond. Um, uh, so many emerging uh, uh, filmmakers, emerging artists have been extraordinary, over 120 films. And I'm thrilled to announce that this evening we will be joined by a University of Virginia alum and friend, Mr. Paul Young Witt, uh, who is the producer of Dead Poets Society and had, has had an illustrious career in both film and television. And I won't give that away because that will be covered later this evening in, in a discussion afterwards and also Academy Award winning screenwriter, Mr. Tom Shulman. And we're pleased to welcome both of them this evening for discussion after this. <laughs> Joining them on stage will be my good friend, Mitch Levine, who is a film and stage director with credits the world over in theater, film, opera, and dance. Uh, I share this with you because nobody's going to be talking about Mitch afterwards. Mitch is going to be interviewing Tom and uh, Paul as well. Um, he's a directing member of the renowned Actor Studio, was a fellow in performance and design at the Juilliard School, and was the recipient of the first James Cameron Fellowship in directing at the American Film Institute. He was the founding producer and host of AFI's Great Filmmaker Series. Mitch is also the founder of the Film Festival Group, a global consulting firm for festivals, filmmakers, and distribution companies. He served as executive director and CEO of the Palm Springs International Film Festival and co-created and produces First Time Fest. So I encourage you all not only to enjoy this wonderful and exceptional film this evening, which is the official closing night film of the 27th Annual Virginia Film Festival, but to stick around afterwards for this wonderful conversation. Thank you all, and thanks for making the film festival such a success. Enjoy the film. Extraordinary experience. Please welcome the screenwriter of this movie, Tom Shulman, and his producer. not seen the film before. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Extraordinary, you know? I mean, 25 years have gone by, and it, it is as fresh and alive and as vital as certainly the first time I saw it, I think, as we saw it. Um, congratulations. Thank you. So let's speak about origins. Tell us, if you will, share, if you will, the Montgomery Bell School. Uh, I went to a school called Montgomery Bell Academy, which I think has sent quite a few students to the University of Virginia. Um, in fact, when I, I remember when I enrolled, we had a headmaster named Francis Carter. I think the Carter family is a fairly well-established family in Virginia. And he told us that we would know that we had succeeded at Montgomery Bell if we came to the University of Virginia. <laughs> I think about 20% of my graduating class came here. Um, uh, the school was really not exactly the model for this school because Montgomery Bell, by the time I went there, it was the 60s. It was not a, 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 a sleepover, a, a boarding school. It was a day school. Uh, it was all boys. Uh, we did have a teacher similar to uh, Mr. Keating. His name was Sam Pickering. He was my sophomore uh, English teacher. And um, I think probably in a way the most, he was a, a wonderful guy and seemed to love us. and antic and mischievous guy, and when we came back the next year, he was gone. And rumors were that he had somehow done something wrong, perhaps slept with the headmaster's daughter. We, we didn't know. And none of us ever found out what happened. If we had asked, we would have just found out he'd gotten a better job, gotten a job teaching at the University of Connecticut. But I think the fact that, that I never knew what happened to him left an open question, and that open question, I think years later, sort of plagued me and led me to sort of think about maybe what if this had happened. 
Wow. And so, so what did happen? You know, what, what, not, not there at, at Montgomery Bell, but what led you, what inspired you to, to write this story? Uh, by the time, in, in um, the early or late 70s, early 80s, I was uh, studying at a place called the Actors and Directors Lab. And my teacher was a, a brilliant uh, uh, theater and, and film director named Jack Garfine. And Jack's teacher was also a brilliant theater director, uh, Harold Clarman, who was one of the founders of the group theater, uh, Broadway director, uh, uh, critic, theater critic for the nation, amazing guy. And about every six weeks to two months, he would come from New York to Los Angeles to review Jack Garfine's work, which was in fact our work in Jack's students. Wow. So we would put on uh, bits of plays, pieces of movies, whatever, and Corman would come. He'd usually talk for about two minutes about our piece, and then he would go on for two or three hours about the theater, life, film, every, it was amazing. He was one of the most amazing, if you've ever seen him on film, one of the most amazing speakers you've ever seen. He just seemed to have been everywhere in history at all times. He was an amazing guy. And we would go home after listening to him and think, you know, go out and have drinks and talk about how we were going to change the world. And we were so inspired by Harold. And then, of course, the next day we'd wake up and think, maybe not. But, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, but so I, I set about to write a story about Harold. And it started with an acting school. and. All the students there were, were actors, and it, it fairly quickly became apparent to me that the, the students, anyway, were all the same character. But the student, the, the Neil, who was the uh, one to be an actor, survived that draft. And about a year later, I was thinking, I need to change this, and I thought back to, to Montgomery Bell and Sam Pickering, and they, it all came together there. But that's really remarkable. So, so Paul, how did, how did that script get to you? Um, we had moved our company from Columbia, uh, which became Sony, to Disney because they promised uh, to let us make films. And uh, it was against their own corporate best interest because we were making a lot of money for them in television. But it, ultimately, we faced down uh, our friend Jeffrey Katzenberg and said, come on, you know. So the first few scripts we got were comedies, and he said, no, we do comedy on television. We want to do something more serious. And we read this screenplay and fell in love. And it became a true passion for all of us. Uh, the, the values in this screenplay are so extraordinary and the awards that you won are so well deserved because you don't get to see films like this much anymore, if at all. Uh, we decided this had to be made. Fortunately, Peter Weir responded the same way we did, and Peter had real heat at that time. Peter, Peter Weir was the director of the film, directed films like Witness and exactly. Mosquito Coast and this he was extraordinary a body of Gallipoli. Well, Gallipoli was the inspiration for me wanting him, quite frankly, uh, because there were kind of vague similarities in terms of uh, a group of boy men. Um, and, and Peter took this great screenplay and turned it into a great film. He is a, he is a mm -hmm. wonderful director. This is very complicated. Um, he got a performance from Robin that we hadn't seen before. And Robin, to these kids, most of whom were green, were inexperienced, Robin actually became that figure because he was so generous and so patient with the kids and kept them so loose and kept them laughing and inspired and they adored them much the same way uh, as characters they adored their future. And, and what an extraordinary cast you assembled. They're almost household names now. Robert Sean Leonard and Ethan Hawke and Josh Charles and, and the rest. Oh, and incidentally, yesterday was Norman Lloyd's 100th birthday and he's still with us. Wow. So, how, how about that, you know, 25 years I ran into Norman about a year ago in the 
parking lot of a grocery store. He was walking out. I said, Norman, he had his tennis. Oh, Tom. Uh, a friend of mine plays yeah. tennis with Yeah, he's, play, he's on his way to go home and play tennis and then have a dinner for him. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so what was the process of finding this extraordinary group of especially young actors to... Well, uh, Howard Muir, who, who was the casting director, really knew what he was doing, and he knew of kids in of young actors in every town that had any kind of theater. I mean, he really knew what he was doing. Uh, we saw literally thousands of kids. Peter had great patience, great insight, um, and we were fortunate to end up with this group. But it was, it, it took months and months and months, and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of kids, some of whom felt that kind of rejection that all actors experience on a, on a regular basis. But we ended up with a brilliant cast. You did indeed. Um, Tom, what, what was the collaboration like between you and Peter as, as the project evolved? Uh, it was wonderful. Peter, started off by saying to me, why, did you, why aren't you directing <laughs> I laughed and said, you know, it's, that wasn't going to be in the car. It's just going to be weird. Well, yeah, exactly. He said, uh, he said well, I, I know that you want to direct it. And so if you want, he said, I want you on the set. And if you'd like, just feel free to ask me any questions and make any comments you want and, and participate any way you want. So, uh, you know, the first few takes, I was in his face right away going, what about this, what about that? And he said to me, you know, uh, why don't you do me a favor and just count to 10 before you <laughs> speak? And I said, you know what, I'll just go home. He said, no, no, don't be petulant, just count to 10. So I would count to 10 and talk to him. He said, I just need to have my own thoughts before you get in there. One time he said, I made a comment and he said, well, why don't, why don't you try it? If you think that's the way the scene should play, try it. And I said, why? He said, you want to direct? Go direct the scene. And I said, oh, Peter. He said, no, no, go talk to the actors. And he said, Robin? So I said, well, what if, what if I screw it up? He goes, I'll fix it. <laughs> so I went over and I said something. Robin, we tried it. He said, what do you think? I said, I don't think it works. What do you think? He goes, I don't either. <laughs> so, but I have to say, I've never had an experience with another director like that. The confidence and the, 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 just the collaborative nature of and that generosity and spirit, both with you, um, obviously, to offer the writer, this is something that is never done in Hollywood, A, that the writer is invited to the set as a rare right. thing, and B, given the opportunity to actually speak with the actors, even rarer. Yeah, yeah, so, so, that, so that's wonderful. So let, let, let's talk a little bit about how Robin became part of the production. I mean, was, was he first choice? Was, what, that was the imagination from, from the get-go. Yeah. Uh, he had done um, uh, a couple of terms as a serious actor, um, and uh, he had a, an energy that we believed audiences were to find believable in terms of a teacher who could inspire. Um, and Peter himself was that kind of inspirational guy, mm -hmm. uh, and he brought in, by the way, um, John Seal, the, the cinematography is absolutely breathtaking mm -hmm. in this, and, uh, and his editor and his production designer. And so he uh, was as much, a, and, and all good directors are producers as well, uh, but this is, this is a masterwork, I think, and something that, that we're all incredibly proud of. Um, in terms of Robin, filled with irony and sadness, and uh, we all miss him terribly. Yeah. He, he encouraged Robin to bring as much of himself as he could to the park, and I think it's, it's a pair of a lot of the, you know, the dinging of the bell and things like that, that's, that's Robin, and so the synthesis of his comedy and the, and the script. So. But, but what's so remarkable to me about his performance is that he doesn't do, forgive me, the Robin Williams shtick with the performance. It's so subtle and so nuanced that even when he's, even when he's imitating Marlon Brando, it's, it, it's, it's, it's with reason and truth and intent and, and, and complete
complete believability. And you know, for those who at that moment, you know, only knew him really from, from the funny stuff, I, I think it's a remarkable tribute to him as as part of this collaboration. It seemed to me the essence of his character was to reach these boys, and Robin gave of himself in that way. You can you feel the feel the connection. And they
and then as, as production was completed, you're finishing, Maurice Jarre wrote the extraordinary score for this film. He wrote the score for Lawrence of Arabia, which some of you might be familiar with. It's, uh, how did he become involved? And, and you know, it, his contribution is astounding. It's a brilliant, and it never calls attention to itself, uh, which is always what a great score is about. Um, that was Peter. Yeah, Peter wanted it, and he said, yeah, he said, yeah, and then he tried to get Lewis John, and there it was. Peter's work with the actors, they're all young. Many of them, it's their first time, their first time on screen. What, what, did, did you spend time with the actors, kind of sharing what you were? life story was, what your connection to it was, as both writer and wife liver? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, we talked, we just, we, we horsed around, we had a reading the day before we started shooting. No uh, prior rehearsals of that? No prior rehearsals of that. Uh, I was in a panic after the reading without discussing with anyone. Went back to my motel room and wrote the entire script all night. <laughs> got there the next day and people said, what are you talking about? It's fine. And I thought, okay. So, uh, but then uh, there were no rehearsals until the actual shots went on. Usually he would shoot the rehearsal, he would play his music, the kids would, the boys would come up to me sometimes and go, well, what is this music? What does he want me to do? What's happening? I would say, I don't know. And they would just, you know, step into the shot and do their lines. It, it, was, it was really amazing. He, had very, he only talked to the actor if he felt there needed to be something changed. Otherwise, he basically just let them go. So, uh, and yet the music that he played was selected specifically for the community he wanted, and people just got it. So this film was very well recognized, was very well awarded, um, was nominated for Oscar for Best Picture, Robin Williams was nominated, was nominated, Peter Weir was nominated, and you won the Oscar. So there was lots of amazing public response, but it's or industry response. What was amazing to me, as I remember very clearly, was the more private public response, if you will. The effect it had on that generation of teenagers was astounding. A, a very dear friend of mine took her 15-year-old son to see it at the time, and he, he wept for days following the film, and it changed his life. I mean, that's a tribute to you. It's a tribute to Peter. It's a tribute to you and this cast and everyone else. And, you know, it's interesting to think now, 25 years, 25 years beyond this actual production, that it still has that power, I think, to touch, to inspire, to, to, to be a part of, of a conversation about life itself and art. So you've contributed something, I think, you both have, to this, to, to who and what we are as a culture. And I think that's remarkable. Did you have a sense at the time, when, when production was finished, when you saw the, you know, the first cut of the film or the final cut of the film, that it would have that impact? Did you know? Did you believe? <laughs> <laughs> because so often, writers will say, oh my god, it's so not what I thought it was going to be. You know? Well, it, it, it was what I thought it was going to be in terms of the, the production, whether I thought it would have any impact at all. I, I think it was a total surprise. I mean, it, it, it was such a drama, saga to get it made and so forth. I was just happy that it, it was in existence. So, uh, no sense. And I, and I remember the first screening I went to just feeling like, particularly when the suicide came up, the whole audience is just going to walk out of the dance. So, uh, that, it, that they didn't feel the end. And, and, and Paul, did you, and did, did you feel vindicated in terms of your, your cohorts at Columbia at the studio? In, in bringing this forth to the world? We were more than thrilled to have been a part of it. And, you know, it starts with the screenplay, with the words, with the concept. Um, and it came together, it came together in a way that we could not have imagined. Um, even the post-production uh, process, uh, because Peter took the film and, and his editor and did it in Australia. And, brought us a three-hour film that was wonderful, but it played like it was an hour too long. And it was, because so much of it was brilliant, the editing process was very painful for Peter. But he did, he got it down to uh, a, a close to a perfect length. Um, it went through the normal studio testing, and um, having been through that process before we all uh, 
didn't get frightened over. But when you ask people for opinions, uh, sometimes they feel like have to give one, whether it's what they're actually thinking or not. Uh, but it was just a blessed project. Um, it also was as big a hit as it was here. It was a, a great hit in Europe, in England and France, and, I mean, in Italy. It took just about every European award that it, you know, it was up for. Uh, so its impact was international. It's great. And it, its impact on language was international. I mean, everyone, everyone, everyone from Saturday Night Live to the guy in the street was shouting out Carpe Diem for, for <coughs> months following the release of the film. And that's, that's, that's high praise. There, there's a few quotations that you wrote, if you will. Um, that, I, you know, when, when Robin Williams says, only in their dreams can man truly be free. I mean, that's you. I didn't write that. But you did. <laughs> no, Robin, it's, uh, it shows you, the first day of the shoot, Peter walked in and said, I'm, I'm a collaborative director. I like input from everyone. If everyone here has, anyone here has anything they want to say, you can come straight to me or make sure it gets to me. The only thing I ask is don't be upset if I don't take your suggestions. So on uh, about the fifth day of the shoot, a man walked up to me, he was Robin's stand-in, and he said, I have a poem that will work for that scene better than the one you wrote. And I said, great, okay. He said, I'll give it to you the day of. And I said, all right. So we were getting ready to shoot the shot, and he walked up and he gave it to me, and I said, he's right. He gave it to Robin, and he went, great, and he did it. That was mm -hmm. Wow, what a great story. <laughs> story. Isn't that fabulous? Yeah. So, uh, around the much for this piece. <laughs> 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 There's so many other words yeah. that are you? Like carpet that's my Um You know, you made it around the same time, you know, you, you made Honey, I Shrunk the Kids and Medicine Man, two very different kinds of movies from, from this. You know, how, how, did, um, how did those happen, like, in your fertile imagination to come up with, with such different stories, kind of in a compressed period of time? How, uh, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids was a rewrite, so that was Disney's idea. Got it. And uh, Medicine Man, uh, my wife had, had traveled to Costa Rica to uh, sort of uh, learn about the rainforest and had met a guy who was passionate about saving the rainforest, and I became passionate about saving the rainforest, so a guy named Dan Jansen, who was a, uh, a, uh, a professor at the University of Pennsylvania. And uh, so I sort of shaped uh, an idea around Have a small icon, Sean Connery. Sean, yeah, just, yeah, 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 yeah. It was quite remarkable. Now, you, you've produced a, a lot of things. You know, been involved in so you know, Insomnia and Three Kings and so many more. I have to ask you about the Partridge Family because I grew up with this. <laughs> what, 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 what was? Tell me a little story of that experience. I wish I could tell you a happy story about it. <laughs> it was kind of a nightmare because you. The business can, especially series, can be very, very hard on kids. And uh, I did the pilot, and I did the first year, and I walked away from a hit because of what I was seeing and could not stop. Um, and I was never sorry. Uh, I never did a series again um, that featured kids that young, and we chose the kids, the children, uh, we worked with very, very, very carefully in areas beyond their talent. Um, it's tough, and that show was painful for me in that respect. Oh, it's, interesting. it's interesting. Well, you went the complete opposite direction in terms of age with, with the Golden Girls. So. Yes, we did. <laughs> <laughs> right after Partridge Family, I did Brian's song. Questions and then we'll, then we'll let these guys, you know, go on. Yes, ma'am, right there. Yes. Um, so Robin Williams' humor seemed to be almost um, so organic; it just came out like whack a mole. You know, like there was no real uh, control over it. So did it seem like he was suppressing that the whole time he was filming? Uh, I don't think. 
Boy Scout. In fact, the, I remember the first day Robin showed up for a, 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 a shot. Uh, he was going to be there for a day, and then he was going to go to New York for two weeks to be in the play. And he seemed almost too on book, so literal in the way he was delivering the lines that it, it, it worried me because I wanted more of Robin's here. And Peter agreed, and he said, well, we've got two weeks to think about it. So when Robin came back, Peter did an improv with Robin. He said, you know, just come here. What would you like to teach the class? A little Shakespeare, maybe? You want to read to them? A couple of the scenes stayed in the movie. He said, I'll, I'll, Peter said to Robin, I'll shoot this. Come in and just, just teach him something. And Robin came in and did that improv. He did the John Wayne thing. He was reading from that book. And something connected. It was, Robin realized, oh, even though I'm not doing all the talking, it's a dialogue. It's, I'm looking, I'm getting something from these kids. It changed his performance right away from that. They, Robin, uh, Peter never said another word that I know of to Robin about performance. It, Robin just got it. So it became him, uh, 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 Peter called him Robin Keating. So it became <laughs> Robin and that character became the same guy. And, and wow. So it, it felt to me like whatever wacky humor Robin used, say, on Mork and Mindy or in his improv, he didn't use that. It was all blended into to the teaching. Yes? Uh, Midsummer Night's Dream doesn't come into the movie until about halfway through, but it seems like Shakespeare's play kind of informs their parallels throughout, and I wonder if that's something that was in the screenplay or that you intended. The question is about Midsummer Night's Dream not really appearing until late in the, in the film, but somehow informing a, a lot of the film. So. Yeah. yeah, well, thematically, they share similarities, and uh, it's just a question of you know, when in the story of the movie you need the, the play. I think we thought maybe that we could have a couple of rehearsals that we would get to, but those were not, not shot. Yes, ma'am. So you talked about your story and the role that you know, related to the film. Was there something like a dead poet society in your school, or how did that concept go up? No, just drinking club. <laughs> 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 yes, yes, sir. someone, but it was different. It didn't, I mean, it was a sort of mathematical formula in an old textbook. And so it was changed just enough to not have to pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> but unfortunately, something like that did exist. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to read one last thing, and, uh, and we'll say goodnight. We don't read and write poetry because it's cute. We read and write poetry because we are members of the human race. And that human race is filled with passion. Thank you for sharing your passion, both of you. Tom Shulman, Paul Younger, with thank you for